This is the Jeffersonians and the Federalists' Objective 2 about how a Jeffersonian was different than a Federalist and what Thomas Jefferson's domestic policy approaches were. Now, right off the bat, let's get this thing out of the way so the terms aren't confusing. Uh, as you know, since the days of the ratification of the Constitution, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists were really at odds with each other. The Federalists were all about, uh, you know, strong central government and support for the wealthy. It was made up of, uh, of the upper class in society for the most part. And they believed in extending that strong central government power into the states and having some impact on states' rights and the lives of private citizens, as you know through the policies of Alexander Hamilton. An anti-federalist was the exact opposite of that. An anti-federalist had never wanted the Constitution to be ratified because they knew it would give the national level of government more power. They were people who were more of the, the common man type, uh, rural farmers who liked states' rights and liked the Tenth Amendment and liked, to have, liked local governments to have more say in governing than strong central government. And the leader of the anti-federalists was Thomas Jefferson. So if you were an anti-federalist and a supporter of Thomas Jefferson, then you were a Jeffersonian. A Jeffersonian is essentially an anti-federalist. And we already know what that is, and that's what makes a Jeffersonian different than a federalist. Now, Thomas Jefferson is the, again, leader of the anti-federalists and a rival of Alexander Hamilton and his federalist policies, but you're going to find that Jefferson's own personal contradictions uh, in his personality are going to play a role in his policies as president later on. In one hand, let's take a look at his personality for a second. He's lanky, he's relaxed, he's non-aggressive, and he's quiet. But he could also motivate people individually. And talking to people one-on-one -on -one was a tactic he made very good use of at various dinner parties he had. Dinner parties were a very important political tactic for Jefferson to motivate individual people into major political movements. And that was quintessential Jefferson, walking contradictions. Quiet on one hand, but could motivate people into major movements on the other hand. A wealthy aristocrat with a lot of land who lived in a mansion called Monticello, as you see here in the picture, and owned slaves. He probably should have been a Federalist, but he considered himself a traitor of the upper class and always felt sympathy for the common man, especially the oppressed, and supported states' rights. Jefferson was a man who favored agriculture over industry and felt that wealthy manufacturers should not get special privileges. One of his favorite quotes was, Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Above all, Jefferson supported rule by the people, not the central government. The best government to him is the one that governs least. However, and this is also a bit of a contradiction, to him, rule by the people did not include all of the people. He felt only the literate white males should be allowed to vote. The ignorant, in his eyes, were incapable of self-government and needed to be taught before they could be allowed to vote. However, it is important to remember that he's more of an advocate for rule by the people than by the Federalists. But again, you can see these contradictions in his personality. Now, in the election of 1800, it was a replay of the election of 1796. Again, John Adams, the Federalist, versus Thomas Jefferson, the Anti-Federalist, which also came to be known at this point as the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists were at a disadvantage due to the Alien and Sedition Acts. I mean, what Adams had done there had just made him a hated figure with the American people. And also, a huge debt and taxes were put in place to prepare for a war with France, a war that ended up never happening. We'll get to more on that later when we study uh, foreign policy. Now, Adams and the Federalists decided to attack Jefferson's character. It had been rumored for quite some time that Thomas Jefferson had been sleeping with his slaves, notably one named Sally Hemings, and in the modern day, in recent years, we have found that out to be true. But the Federalists also attacked Jefferson's character on the issue of the separation of church and state. Jefferson promoted the separation of church and state 
and therefore he was accused of being an atheist, of hating God. But despite these attacks from Adams and the Federalists, Jefferson wins the election of 1800, 73 to 65 in the Electoral College. He got some decent help from the state of New York that put him over the top, a state that traditionally might have voted for Adams. Jefferson calls the victory the Revolution of 1800, saying that America is returning to the ideals of the revolution against Britain, ideals that he felt Adams and the Federalists had betrayed with overpowering, over-oppressive government policies. As for Adams, despite his long and distinguished career, uh, as you can see here, uh, defending British soldiers in the Boston Massacre, helping Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence and convincing many of the delegates to accept it, negotiating the treaty that ended the American Revolution, and serving as vice president and president, well, Adams basically becomes the last Federalist president, and the party slowly begins fading away at that point. The election of 1800 is effectively the end of the Federalist Party, as it became irrelevant and is completely gone by the 1830s. Jefferson, meanwhile, becomes the first president to actually be inaugurated in Washington, D.C. Uh, John Adams had been the first to live there in the last year of his term in 1801, but when Jefferson gets inaugurated in Washington, D.C. in 1801, he becomes a different kind of president. Very unconventional in most ways, he was pretty relaxed. Uh, often, Jefferson would answer his own door in pajamas. He wouldn't have a butler do it. He would just answer his own door in his pajamas. He was also the first president to not personally deliver messages to Congress, sending a clerk instead. That was a practice that would continue for 112 years until Woodrow Wilson's presidency. Now, Jefferson gets elected twice, in 1800 and again in 1804, and therefore would be a two-term president who served from 1801 to 1809. Remember, you get elected in November and you get inaugurated the following year. But his domestic policies often reflected the quote-unquote two Thomas Jeffersons, as Jefferson was a man of numerous contradictions. On one hand, he was a very private and scholarly philosopher. In fact, he is the founder of the University of Virginia, and that spoke to his educational side. On the other hand, he was a public servant, and there his philosophies often sounded good in theory, but were hard to put into practice. Jefferson himself, as you can see right here on Mount Rushmore, is often recognized as one of America's greatest presidents. And that would prove to be ironic because the fact of the matter was he hated being president, so much so that he refused to have it on his tombstone. There's absolutely no mention of it. His tombstone mentions that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence and the father of the University of Virginia, but again has no mention of him being the President of the United States for two terms, despite the fact that he was put on Mount Rushmore and was admired by so many people. Again, just another example of Jefferson, Jefferson being a man of numerous contradictions. The contradictions in his personality were also often re reflected in his policies as president. As president, he reversed many of the beliefs that he had held before being president. It was often easy to use one of his quotes to refute another one. And despite the fact that he had been such a strong anti-federalist when George Washington held the presidency and John Adams did, when he became president himself, he kept most of the Federalist policies in place, except for Adams' Alien and Sedition Acts, and he kept most of the Federalists who were appointed by Adams, rather than fire them in favor of the anti-Federalists who had elected him. Now, that raised a pretty significant question in the eyes of many Jeffersonians. Was Thomas Jefferson still an anti-Federalist, or had the self-proclaimed traitor of the upper class now turned into a traitor of the common man. Well, a lot of Jeffersonians were wondering about that, and many of them began to turn away from Thomas Jefferson, accusing him of becoming a Federalist in his thinking. Actually, Thomas Jefferson was more of a moderate. Now, it was obvious that he was no longer as passionate about being an anti-Federalist as, 
as he had been before he became president. But he also wasn't a full-fledged Federalist either. There were plenty of their policies that he disagreed with. It's just that Jefferson looked at both sides a lot of the time when he was president and took a moderate approach, not really totally um, jumping on board with either one of them, but doing what he, be- what he thought was best uh, for the country as the American president. One of the most noteworthy policies that took place during his presidency was the Judiciary Act of 1801. On their last night in office, the Federalist Congress and John Adams had created positions for 16 new federal judges. It was meant to pack the court with Federalists who could thwart anti-Federalist policies once Jefferson became president. Adams had also appointed well-known Federalist John Marshall to the U.S. Supreme Court, Chief Justice Marshall would serve as the ghost of the Federalists on the U.S. Supreme Court for the next 34 years until his death in 1835. It's still the longest term of any Chief Justice to this point. Marshall had been born in a Virginia log cabin and served at Valley Forge during the American Revolution. He saw the disadvantages of a weak central authority in government during that time, and that's what made him a Federalist, committed to strengthening the power of the federal government. His only formal education for law was six weeks of law lectures at the College of William and Mary, and despite his limited college education, Marshall University in West Virginia is named after him. Now, while Marshall University, I'm sure, is an outstanding scholarly institution, most people are probably more familiar with their athletic exploits as the Marshall Thundering Herd. But again, despite his limited college education, he had a profound impact on the foundations of American constitutional law. He was a brilliant, commanding personality, And when the Federalist Party started to die out after Adams' defeat in the 1800 election, the ghost of the Federalists stubbornly lived on for another 34 years through the administrations of many anti-Federalist presidents, being a thorn in their side, enacting various decisions that reflected Federalist ideals and policies. But back to the Judiciary Act. The new Anti-Federalist, now known as the Jeffersonian Congress, repealed it in 1802. William Marbury, on the left, was one of the judges who lost his seat when the, Judi- when the Judiciary Act of 1801 was repealed. He therefore sued the Secretary of State, James Madison, again, Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, who himself would later become President of the United States. John Marshall decided to throw out the lawsuit, but gained something big in exchange. It was the U.S. Supreme Court case Marbury v. Madison in 1803. Marshall said that Marbury could not sue Madison, saying that what Marbury was doing was unconstitutional. In doing so, Marshall created the concept of judicial review, the right of the U.S. Supreme Court to have final authority of interpreting what the Constitution says. And while Marbury v. Madison was a highlight of the Jefferson administration, the embargo of 1807 was not. The embargo of 1807 was uh, Jefferson's attempt to have no U.S. goods sold in foreign markets. It It was meant to show foreign nations how badly the U.S. goods were needed, but it failed miserably. A major surplus of American goods developed because they couldn't be sold anywhere, I'm sorry, and an illegal black market along the Canadian border started up. The U.S. people began to view Jefferson as a tyrant, and people started reviving the weak Federalist Party. The embargo was eventually repealed in 1809 and was replaced by the Non-Intercourse Act, which kept the embargo with Britain and France only, but opened up trade with the rest of the world. And that was basically the end of the domestic policies for Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist, which was also known as a Jeffersonian, who basically, in a lot of ways, turned federalist to some degree. That's it. Thanks for listening.